in our series on the story. It is a 31-week Genesis to Revelation study. I have a confession to make to you this morning. Today I feel a little like I've been assigned a text in preaching class. You know, when you're in seminary and the professor says, you will preach on this topic. And uh, I confess to you, this is not the text I would have chosen. It's not the text I would have chosen for Homecoming Sunday and the Sunday before Thanksgiving for the Thanksgiving message. <laughs> Tried to get out of it. I said to the Lord, well, we'll just put it off a week. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me, this is not the text that you have chosen today, but it is the text that I have chosen today. And I felt like the Lord wanted me to stay with it. So the title of today's message is Standing Tall and Falling Hard. And we're going to look, it's kind of like, I've shared this with you before, sometimes when we look at the Old Testament, it's like watching as a small child your older brother going through some kind of a trauma or a difficulty or discipline and if you're a smart little brother or sister you say well I don't want to do what they did and God can bless us through the experience of our older brothers and sisters the theme this morning is that obedience matters and we're going to look at three distortions of our faith we're going to look at three distortions of our faith that can surely bring us down and with the help of Jesus and with the help of the Holy Spirit we're going to just take a look at this in a historical context and uh, I, I thank God because I was going to share one time I was reading a passage just like this and I raised my hand in class and I said to the professor how do I reconcile that with the Christian faith today? Before the end of the sermon, I will share his answer to us and to me. Our scripture this morning is found in 1 Samuel 8, verses 1 through 10. I may not be able to stop at verse 10. Don't mean to throw Nelson a curve there, but it's okay. If you got your Bible, 1 Samuel 8, 10, you can follow on the wall. When Samuel became old, he made his son judges over Israel. The name of the firstborn son was Joel, and the name of the second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not follow in his ways. They were rotten kids. They turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old. And your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Sam, Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people and all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Just as they have done to me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Now then, listen to their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. Just real quick. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run for his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. 
And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, but we are determined to have a king over us so that we may be like other nations and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, listen to their voice and set a king over them. Samuel then said to the people, each of you return home. May the Lord richly bless this reading of his holy word that it may change our lives this day. It is in your name we pray. Amen. There's three things that brought them down, the Israelites down, and their king down in their faith. And those same three things are at work today. Let me just give you a quick backdrop of these major distortions that we, would, we need to avoid like the plague. We'll begin, and again, we're just tracking through the story. If any of you want to you know, read the narrative, we have the, you know, the, the chronological uh, you know, the story. We have copies available. If you, if you want to follow along, we study it further in Sunday school and also in Tuesday. And uh, it's also available online on our uh, computer website. The backdrop of three major uh, dangerous distortions. There was a man named Elkanah in Ephraim. He had two wives. Oh, two wives in the Bible? <coughs> wow! Sounds exciting, doesn't it? In the Bible, a multiple marriage is never a happy marriage. Find one that's happy in the Bible, and you won't. There's always extra stress because of that. I'll leave that alone. <laughs> Just leave that hanging out. He had two wives, Ham and Peninnah. Ham was childless, and the other wife just loved to razz her about. I've got kids in you, though. And it was just, it was terrible. She purposely provoked Hannah's pain. So Hannah went to Shiloh. Shiloh is a place deep in South Jersey. It is near Quinton and Hancock's Bridge. If you ever want to know where Hannah went, just drive down, drive down to South Jersey. Before you hit the Delaware Memorial Bridge, go left. And you'll find Shiloh. The tabernacle used to be down in Shiloh. And Hannah went there, and she went, and she prayed, God, you've got to help me. I want to have a baby. If you give me a baby, the baby is yours. I'll dedicate him to you. I'll bring him back to this tabernacle and he will be all yours. Eli, the priest, not totally in touch with God, sees this woman moving her lips and uh, accuses her of being drunk. Hannah goes, I'm not drunk. I'm praying to God. And Eli, the priest, says, well, God's going to give you what you ask for. God hears Hannah's prayer and Samuel is born, which means God has heard. Samuel is born, and after Samuel is weaned and a young child, Hannah, true to his word, takes Samuel to the temple. And for you biblical scholars, we know the story. Samuel is a young boy. Each year his mother would go to visit him. He's a young boy, and, and uh, all of a sudden he hears a voice calling him. So he goes to the Eli, the priest, hey, you called me. No, he says, no, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Second time, you called me. I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Third time, he goes to Eli. Eli says, hey, something's going on here. I didn't call you. This may be. Next time it happens, say, speak, Lord, for your servant listens. And this is the beginning of a very powerful vertical relationship that Samuel has, that Samuel has with the Lord. We'll look right now. There's three major distortions in this section of the story of God's purpose. The first distortion that happens is the distortion of phoniness. The distortion of phoniness. At Shiloh, the priest was Eli, and he had two sons, 
Hophni and Phineas. They were also robbing kids. They abused the sacrificial system. Imagine, imagine bringing in my turkeys and hams this morning and my boy standing at the door with forks. <laughs> They'll say, hey, that looks good. We'll take that home. And people were bringing in sacrifices and the kids were standing there with forks just taking the best and saying, I'll have that now. That wasn't the worst of it. There were many immoral acts that were taking place. They were using their power to, uh, to be very inappropriate. Eli doesn't reprimand his sons, just lets them have at it. And God judges them. Eli loses his life. His sons lose their lives. They're losing battles and they figure, hey, well, all we need is let, let, let's just uh, take the Ark of the Covenant which is the Ten Commandments. They, they were going to use it like a good luck charm. And the Philistines end up capturing the Ark of the Covenant. And again, Eli and his two sons, they, they lose their life. Why? Because they had an outward show of religion, but not an inward change in their hearts. They had an outward show they had positions in the, in the, in the tabernacle. They, uh, you know, they were religious. And by the way, the definition of religion is what I do to get God's approval. And it wasn't working. So what does that, how, what do we learn from this? We learn from this that we are called to be genuine on the inside. To be authentic. To live what we believe. Not to have an outward show, but an inward change. That God will do an inside job on each of us. God calls us to be real. And then when we're real, we can really be changed. You know, I told this at my mom's funeral, but... One of my mom's signature thing was she would clean the house all day and somebody would walk up to the door, you know, we we're expecting company and she'd say, take us as we are. <laughs> <laughs> the place is a mess. <laughs> I was like, mom, you cleaned all day. <laughs> you know something I actually, the way the Holy Spirit works, there's the old mind, no saint, there's no saint without a past. And there's no sinner without a future. There's no saint without a past. And there's no sinner without a future. And I Googled this yesterday. I knew it was out there. You know, remember Noah got drunk. Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob lied. Leah was looks challenged. Joseph was abused. Moses had a stutter, stuttering problem and uh, had a body in his past. Had a murder, he had killed someone in his past. Gideon was afraid. Samson had long hair, was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Elijah was suicidal. I think he was manic depressive. Isaiah preached naked. Imagine that. <laughs> Jonah ran from God. Job was went bankrupt, had to start over. John the Baptist ate bugs, Peter denied Jesus. The disciples fell asleep when they prayed, when Jesus needed them the most. Martha was a worrier about everything. The Samaritan woman was divorced more than once. Zacchaeus was too small, Paul was too religious. Timothy had an ulcer. Lazarus was dead. As it is written, there is no one righteous. No, not one. God calls us to be real. Years ago, or not, not that long ago, went to a continuing education event. And uh, again, God, again, the distortion here is phoniness. God calls us to be real. Went to this continuing education event. There was this guy, he wrote, a, he wrote several books about church growth. And uh, he was sitting in a room with pastors. And he said to us, I shared this at committee meetings. He said, I've had three nervous breakdowns. He said, two metaphorically. 
which means one was real, the others he, I guess he learned from the first one. And then he said this, he was talking to pastors. He said this, if God is really doing something in your church, if God is doing really doing something in your life, he's going to put you in a situation where you've got to be more than you can be. Where, where God is going to have to give you strength beyond yourself. Where you're going to need power and strength that you don't got. And that God has. Maybe a good place for us all to start is we are sinners saved by grace. You know, you go to an AA meeting. It says, hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm an alcoholic. And they say back, hi. Like, hi, John. Not my name is John. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, John. Well, good place for us in the church is I'm a sinner saved by grace. Amen. The grace of Jesus Christ, which is abundant and full, and it gives us new life. An opportunity to be real and different at the same time. Second distortion. The distortion of conformity. The people ask Samuel to anoint a king for them. So they can be like the other nations. We want to be like the other nations. We want to be like every other nation. God tells Samuel, by the way, the Samuel guy, he needs Jesus too. You read about Samuel. Pretty crusty guy. But Samuel's following God here. God tells Samuel the people are not rejecting him, but that they're rejecting God. God says to Samuel, they have not rejected you. They have rejected me from being king over them. You know, instead of being safe and secure in the loving arms of God, now they're going to be under a king. Instead of safe and secure from all alarms, under God, in a special society where they have a vertical relationship with God, a special relationship, they say, we don't want you, God, we want a king. There's only so much a king or a president can do. They are not God. Though they will act like it sometime. Just think of the claims in the recent election. Both sides. The claims. I will do this. I will do that. No confession of powerlessness. Which is what we really need when we need God to act. You say to God, Lord, you're the only help I got. You're the only help. I need. Be careful, as my grandma's mom would say, be careful what you ask for. And the Israelites make a big mistake. We want to be like everyone else. And we make that same mistake too when we want to be like everyone else. It's kind of like when you're a little kid and your name is a little strange. A little weird. You know, my last name is Dahl. It was a terrible name. It was a terrible name through junior high school. But once you're out of junior high, it's not so bad. I mean, Gwen would ask me, sometimes I'd go into a pizza parlor. Uh, you know, John, six. You know? She says, why don't you say Dahl? So, John is better. John. John. It's a man's name, you know? But then when you get older, that thing that embarrassed you when you were younger, it's unique and it's special. And maybe even in some of our lives today, there's something about us that seems different. Maybe that's the very thing God has made a signature about you in your life. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and, per and perfect. You know, we're not to be worried so much about our neighbors, where our major relationship is to be this way. You know? God, what do you want me to do? Maybe... What I drive isn't that important. Maybe where I live isn't that important. Maybe a lot of things that I think are important aren't that important. Help us, Jesus. Third distortion. 
that they get in trouble with is misrepresentation. This is where I had to have a conversation with my seminary professor. 1 Samuel 9 through 13. God allows the people to have a king. It is his permissive will, not his perfect will. You know, like the way you give something to a kid, he just keeps asking you for it. I want it, I want it, I want it. I don't really think that's good for you. I don't really think. And then, okay, go ahead. That's the way God is about the king thing. It's his permissive will, not his perfect will. And Samuel anoints Saul. King Saul, he looks the part. He's huge. He's big. He's tall. He's the king. He looks like a king. And he becomes the king. He's empowered by the spirit and he defeats the Ammonites. However, Saul, in his next move, disobeys God. And God makes a command to totally destroy the Amalekites for their sin. But Saul doesn't do that. He decides that he'd like to keep their king as a trophy, and he takes the best of the cattle and the best of the sheep, and he holds them back. And then, and we're in tough stuff here, because the Bible says here, I want to obey is better than sacrifice. I'll never forget my Old Testament professor in seminary raising his finger and saying, I want you to know what this means. It means that Saul was supposed to kill everything in the Amalekite society. Why? Because when the Israelites were coming out of Egypt, the Amalekites attacked them. Poor defenseless slaves. And there was a score to be set. And rather than do that, Saul keeps some of the booty for himself. And then Samuel says, why do you do that? He says, well, I want to sacrifice them to the, to the Lord. Be kind of like Judas saying, well, uh, I'll give the 30 pieces to the poor. You know what I'm saying? So one day I raised my hand in seminary class. And I said to my New Testament professor, I said, what do we do with a text like this today? where a society was to be destroyed. And he raised his finger at me and said, our Old Testament professor, Dr. McDaniel, will say this. I'm giving you a hermeneutical key right now. I'm giving you a key to understand the Bible. Hermeneutics is just a study of Scripture. Dr. Rouse said this. What stands in the light of the cross stands. What fades in the light of the cross fades. We have the full revelation of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So that whosoever believes on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The Amalekites were a threat to the Israelites who, by the way, we need to get a savior from. And... As a result, that was the situation then. Here is the situation now. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And we too are representatives of Jesus. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're his representative. And don't misrepresent him. <clears throat> wow. Wow. Don't misrepresent him. That's heavy stuff, isn't it? I might even need his help so that I don't misrepresent him. I might even have to say to God, you're going to have to be, Jesus, you're going to have to be my Lord and Savior. You're going to have to guide me every day because I need your help to live the way you want me to live. You know, I told this years ago when I was in prison ministry, a uh, Baptist minister went into the jail one time an inmate came up to him and said, who is you and what are you here for? He said, I'm an ambassador for a king. That's who we are. We're an ambassador, a representative of Jesus. We conclude on this homecoming Sunday, God calls us to be different. We are called to be like Jesus. Real. Real. The great place to start is, I am a sinner saved by grace. 
That's a great place to start. Every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. We are called to be vertically tuned in. Vertically tuned in. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. A psychologist who was talking to a group of preachers said this, I can change your life by how you think. Wow! Talk about an inside job. And we're called to be true representatives of Jesus. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And here's our little Thanksgiving piece today. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Today, there's a call on our life to thank Jesus for everything he has given us, especially new life, especially new life. A buddy of mine, years ago when I had the fish market, he walked in the front door of that fish, net, fish market, he said, I have new life in Jesus. I have new life in Jesus. And we rejoice in that new life. And in that new life, we have a calling on our lives to be real. To be in tune with God. And to sing a song to a hurting world. For it's in His name. His name is precious. In God. Did not wait for us. He came to each of us and wooed us into the kingdom of God. Let us live like we've never lived before. In Him. Let's pray. Jesus. Lord, we thank You for new life on this Thanksgiving Sunday. We rejoice in You. Help us to be real. Help us to be in tune with You. And Lord, we're the only Bible that some people will read. So help us to be a song to a hurting world. Your name is precious, and it is in your name we pray. Like a river flow in us, among us, through us, and beyond us. It is in your name we pray, Jesus. All God's people say, Amen. Amen. Please stand with me. Let's sing together our final hymn this day.